Corinthians, please. We uh, enjoyed our time revisiting our hymns of the faith on this Lord's Supper Day. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. If you're online with us this morning and looking for a title, it is In Remembrance of Me. That's our title today. And this morning we're going to begin looking at one of the two ordinances that the Lord gave us to remember His death for our sins. The one we are talking about today has been called many things. It is, by, by various denominations, it has been called communion, it's called mass, it's called Corpus Christi, it's called the Eucharism, it's called the Last Supper, we call it the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? What's it for? What, is it, what does it mean? Who could participate? How often should it be done? Does the church have to do it? Those are all really good, powerful, important questions, and we are going to look at the answers to those questions today. Once again, 1 Corinthians 11, and so let's look at the passage first, is verse, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. Apostle Paul writes this particular passage, and he is answering various questions from the church at Corinth. They wrote a letter to him and said, Paul, how do we do this? How do we do that? What should we not do about this? And and the whole letter of 1 Corinthians is Paul answering questions and giving biblical instruction. And that's Uh, in light of the last statement when he says about other things, I'll tell you when I get there. So he's answering a question about the Lord's Supper, and from the answer to that question, we are given some instructions to learn from today. We're reviewing the fundamentals of the church. It's a new series we began last week, um, Fundamentals of the Faith. And reviews are good. I mean, for most of us, not for all, but for most of us, it's a review. Reviews are good and necessary. In particular, we are talking about um, our faith together. We could, we could talk about the fundamentals of our individual faith as we walk with Christ, but this series is about what it means to practice worship, to serve the Lord corporately. And so there's different elements and aspects of that in the next few weeks we're talking about. Last week, as James re- recalled, <clears throat> um, the summary of last week's message is really the, the symbols in your bulletin, if you have one of those today. Promised you we would have that. Um, We have our our logo that we've had for a couple of years now that just kind of identifies with what we believe God's called us to do, and that's to follow Christ together. Reaching all generations to follow Christ together is our mission statement, what we're about. And then on the back side, you have that map that we talked about from Acts chapter 2, and the map of discipleship. What has God called us to do? He's called us to worship, to belong, and to impact the world with the gospel. And it's really all three of those things intertwined, and then they're ongoing, constant, to be steadfast. That's what we do together. And in each one of those elements, as you notice, we had, had three specific parts to it, three specific pieces of, the, of, of each one of them, elements, if you will, that were important. And um, what we'll do in the next coming weeks is you'll have another insert next week that'll take one of them and break that down a little bit more for you, just in review each week. Um, so <clears throat> each one of our... 
Three major functions as a church has its own symbol with three particular parts. And so you can look at that and as a reminder, and we'll dig into each of those. As one of the things we do together, especially as in, in worship, is to share what we're talking about today, which we call the Lord's Supper. Specifically, in um, theological terms, we call it an ordinance. The Lord has given us two ordinances, just two that he gave us, baptism and the Lord's Supper. They were two ceremonies. Ordinances, ordinance basically comes from the word ordained. So God has ordained this. The Lord Jesus says, this is what I want you to practice. These are the two things I want you to follow me in, specifically as symbols. They're ceremonies, basically. Ceremonies that we participate in. Baptism is intended to be practiced at least once by immersion um, of a believer after they have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of their sins. It is a symbol of the new life we have in Christ. It's a symbol of the gospel. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. And that will be the subject of next week's message. In fact, we'll have a baptism next week as well, and that will be exciting. The Lord's Supper is to be repeated regularly by the baptized believer. Um, and we'll talk about what regularly means, but it is to be practiced regularly as a symbol or a reminder of our intimate fellowship, our walk with Christ. Meant <clears throat> these, Both of these two, by the way, are meant to be practiced by the corporate family, not individually. So baptism and the Lord's Supper are, are not individual ordinances. They're not individual practices, nor were the, was the church instructed to practice them that way, but together with the family of God. Every time you see them in Scripture, the family of God is there, or at least a large part of them, or some of them. If they're, <clears throat> Maybe it's only one or two if they're in a new church plant in the middle of nowhere. But it was always a corporate practice. Jesus gave these ordinances to serve as memorials. What is a memorial? A memorial is a visible symbol. We often think, it's, think of it specifically as in relation to someone who's died or some people who've died, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that because the Lord's Supper is a memorial of Christ's death. <clears throat> but it's, not all memorials are about those particular things. Visible symbols represent a lot of things. Take a look at this particular slide. These are visible symbols. Some are historical. Some are modern day but almost all of them immediately recognizable. Each one of them stands for something so that when you see it, you know what's behind it, you know what it means. And they're all different kinds, including our own symbol. There's a church that is there. The Lord's Supper is a visible symbol. It has visible elements to it as well as a practice to it that's a visual reminder. So what's it all about? What do we do? Well, let's look. Paul tells us, first of all, in the first couple of verses, verses 23 through 25, here's what we do when we practice the Lord's Supper. We look back and we remember. We look back and remember. Here's the historical piece of it. So we're, we're reminded of something that took place in the past when we take the Lord's Supper and how important it is. So here's the memorial piece of it, if you will. <laughs> Paul basically says, when he begins at verse 23, let's remember some things about the Supper. In this case, the Lord had given the Apostle Paul the specific instructions for it. Paul was an apostle like Peter, James, and John, only Paul was not at the first Lord's Supper. Instead, Paul is saved later, remember, on the road to Damascus. And the Lord spoke to Paul as a, and a, one of his chosen apostles and gave him specific biblical instructions, things to write down in the Scriptures that he had not, didn't necessarily give others. That's why we have the Scriptures. And Paul says, the Lord Jesus specifically instructed me on the Lord's Supper, and I'm sharing that with you in relation to your question. He says, so, he said, I've taught you about these things before. Let me remind you. The Lord's Supper replaced the Passover meal. Now, when, when Paul speaks in this particular passage, he quotes from the Lord and what the Lord said, and one of the phrases Jesus says is, after the supper, or Paul says, after the supper, the Lord took the cup. So there was a supper going on that wasn't what we call the Lord's Supper. It was called the Passover. The Jewish Passover was practiced once a year. Jesus died on Passover, and that was critical. The Passover was a memorial itself. It was a memorial to the exodus of, from the slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh. So hundreds of years earlier, when the nation of Israel was in slavery, 
God set them free. <clears throat> and when He set them three, free, remember there were plagues. And the very last plague was, you may remember what it was? It was the plague of death. And the wages of sin is what? Death. And so there was a death, the death of the firstborn uh, son of every family who did not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow the instructions that He gave. But if by faith you did that, you sacrificed a lamb in that particular case, then you would be saved. So, it is, so the Jewish festival was looking back to that. What many of the prophets knew, and many of them refused to acknowledge, was that that, that very thing also looked forward to what's about to happen when Jesus initiates the Lord's Supper on the night he was betrayed, his own death. So there were elements of the Passover. One was a lamb. So a lamb was sacrificed in the temple, so every family would have this particular lamb. There were lots of details behind how the, the lamb was supposed to be and how he was raised, and et cetera, et cetera. A bunch of details we won't take the time to get into today. It's not critical to this particular message. But there was a spotless lamb that was to be sacrificed for sin because the wages of sin is death. And so they looked back at that time when the death of sin was covered by the lamb, by the blood of the lamb. There were other parts. There was unleavened bread that was to be taken. Unleavened bread means it's, you don't set the dough aside and let yeast take its time to rise. So it's kind of hard and crunchy and it's not real fluffy and tastes about like the wafer you're going to eat in a little bit. <clears throat> it was terrible because they were in a hurry. And so eating unleavened bread at the Passover over reminded them of the haste with which they left Egypt. I mean, they were gone. When he said the sacrifice meal was to take place of the lamb, the next day, man, they're hightailing it out of there. They had to hurry, as God instructed them. There was a bowl of salt water that was a part of the custom. The salt water rem reminded them of the tears of slavery, as well as the parting of the Red Sea when he delivered them. There was bitter herbs that were to be taken. They didn't taste very good, but they remind them of the bitterness of slavery when they took this particular meal. There was a paste of mashed fruit and nuts, and it was to remind them of the, of the bricks that as slaves they made with clay and mixed with straw. They were to sing particular songs, and there was a structure and an order to this particular meal, and it lasted a while because you had specific elements, and I'm just giving you a tiny fraction of them. But scattered throughout, there were songs to sing. They were from the song book of the hymn book, if you will, of the Jewish people, and that is found in your Bible, and you do know where that is, right? That's the Psalms. Those are songs they sang. They sang Psalm 113 through 118, as well as Psalm 139. And those songs they sang were reminding them that it was God who saved them, and that not them, them they didn't save themselves. There were four cups of wine that were poured in different places of the ceremony, and they were to remind them of the four promises that God made to them found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Every time that they participated in this memorial service, their mind would rush back to the first time this was practiced, to what God had done for them. Of course, while they're practicing this hundreds of years later, they don't personally remember. But that was the point of the memorial, is that every time they practice that, they look back at the Scriptures, they're reminded of what God did for their grandparents and their great-grandparents and so on. And with each time they practice it, they, they are instructing and sharing with the next generation and the new converts about the goodness of God and how He delivered them from slavery. Now, during this meal, remember this is the night Jesus is betrayed. Jesus is going to be the last Passover lamb. He is going to be sacrificed when all, as you, on a cross when all of the other lambs are being sacrificed to the temple. And the night he's betrayed, they participate in this meal. And the next day the lambs will be crucified and so will Christ, if you will. And on that night, while they're celebrating that supper, Jesus takes two parts of the supper. There's lots of parts. I just, again, just gave you a fraction of them. There's different elements, different things in the meal they partook of and had to do a certain way. Jesus, in that meal, takes two of them and says, I'm doing something different. In fact, from this point on, the Passover is no longer necessary. After tomorrow, you won't need to do it ever again. And I'm going to give you another, a new reminder. Reminder. 
a new practice, a new ceremony to remember what's a, what is about to take place for your sins. What the Passover, the original Passover, has always been looking forward to. What that Passover was really all about. It wasn't just about the deliverance of the, of the Egyptian, or excuse me, of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. It, was a, it has always been looking forward to when the Son of God would deliver us from our sins. And he said, I'm going to give you a ceremony to remind you of that. And so he took two elements. He took the bread and he took one of the cups of wine and gave them a new meaning. And Jesus basically said, remember my death for you. We'll celebrate Christmas soon and it's a wonderful holiday and Christians have been celebrating and remembering Jesus' birth for generations and, and it's, it's good to do. There's nothing wrong with it. But Jesus never told us to remember his birth. He told us to remember his death. That's what he put his focus on. Of course, there's no death without a birth, so it's okay if you celebrate Christmas. But his focus was on the death, what it was for and what it meant. He, He was born to what? To die. And he gave the symbol, the night, as I mentioned, he was betrayed, as Paul says. And the first was the bread. The bread, Jesus said, represented or symbolized his body, which was for us. What does he mean by that? We're not just specifically talking about his death yet. He will with the cup. What he's talking about there is the fact that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who is all God, became all man. He came in a body, in human form. He still still was all God, but he became, and fully God, but he became fully man for us and lived the sinless life in that body that you and I were supposed to have lived but couldn't and didn't. And so when he says take this bread, he is reminding us of the fact that, of the incarnation, the fact that God became man who lived the life we should have lived so that he can be our sacrifice. And then he took the cup. And the cup, the wine being red, symbolizes blood. Without the shedding of blood, the Scripture says there is no remission of sins, no forgiveness. Why? Because as the Jews believed, and, and, and which is really true, the life is in the blood. If you don't have no blood in your body, you're not alive. So when blood is shed, someone dies. And Jesus said, this cup is going to represent the shedding of my blood for your sins. He is going to bleed and die on a cross. Now, dear friends, they are symbols. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. He is speaking symbolically. They are not the literal body and blood of Christ. They are symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Catholic teaching today says that the bread and body are, or the bread and the, the wine are the literal elements They change. In other words, the wine and the bread change on the molecular level into the actual body and blood of Christ. It's called transubstantiation. And every time it is taken in that particular teaching, it is professed that Jesus literally is sacrificed all over again. That he literally dies again. That particular teaching was adopted by the Fourth Lateran Council in A.D. 1215. So nearly 1,200 years after Christ died, that teaching developed. Martin Luther, a reformer, a couple hundred years later in the 1500s, had a real struggle with that teaching development that had been around for a couple of hundred years now. He struggled with that teaching, and so he adopted a doctrine of consubstantiation, which Lutherans follow today. And that particular theology says that the elements of the bread and wine, they don't transform into the actual body and blood of Christ, but rather they coexist together with the body and blood of Christ in some miraculous way that can't be explained. But neither of those concepts were adopted by or practiced or believed by the early church because they're both false. When Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper, listen to me clearly, he was still with them. He hadn't even died yet. He was still in his body. Just like the Passover elements that they are participating in, he takes two of them and says, I'm giving them symbolically a new meaning. 
Just like the Passover, they were just symbols, so also is the Lord's Supper. He took two of them and said they are now symbols of something else. Jesus would become that Passover lamb dying for our sins, freeing us from the bitter slavery of sin, the reality of hell. And the word translated, this is the new covenant, this, this, this is in my blood, as, trans, as, as excuse me, translated in verse 25, is the new covenant in my blood implies a cost. It cost Jesus everything for our salvation. So when we take the Lord's Supper, we are looking back and remembering. We remember His life. With the bread, we remember His life. We do remember His miraculous birth. Can't die if He wasn't first born. And so there's the element of the incarnation. We remember that Jesus, all God, becomes man. We remember His life, that He was born of a virgin. We remember His life was sinless. Completely, totally. Not one sin. He cannot be our sacrifice if he had sinned. There was no sin found in him. Completely innocent. We remember that. Jesus died for the guilty. And every one of us are guilty. He's the only one who was ever innocent. Without sin. We remember his authoritative teachings. We we remember his, his miracles. We remember his great love. We remember his life as presented to us in the gospel. We look back and remember. And in particular with the cup, we look back and remember what? His death. We remember his betrayal on the night he, was, he took this supper. And the fact that realistically, because all of us are sinners, we betrayed him too. We look back at the fact that he died in agony. But, we, but before that, we look back and remember, before he was arrested, he was in agony in the garden. The one who had no sin is going to be separated from the Father and they haven't been separated ever in all eternity and now He will be. And taking on the weight of man's sin so agonized Jesus, he, the Scripture says His sweat became drops of blood. We remember that. And though He in His flesh did not want to do it, in His spirit He said, Not my will but Thine be done, God. I surrender, Father, to Your will. We remember His desertion. That when He was arrested... Instead of standing with Jesus, they all scattered. All of his apostles. We remember his trial as he's beaten by the Sanhedrin, as he's flogged by the Romans with the cat of nine tails. We remember that his Pilate presents him before the people against the murderer Barabbas and asks the people, which do you choose? They called for Barabbas and not for the innocent Jesus. We remember that. And we remember... The walk to the cross, carrying the cross beam on his shoulders, so heavy, and him having been so beaten, he couldn't carry it all the way. So Simon, someone in the crowd, was conscripted to carry it for him, and we learn later that Simon and his boys come to know Christ. We remember driving of the nails through his hands and his feet. And we remember him saying, it is finished. Most of all, remember what Jesus said in verse 24. This is my body which is for you. Remember he did it for me. We look back and remember every time we take the supper. We also look within and repent. So there's a past element of the Lord's Supper, but there's a present element. In the moment that we take it, or just prior to taking it, we take a moment again and examine ourselves. That's what Paul's talking about, beginning in verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Christ. Let a, eat, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10... Verse 16, Paul said, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper there, in chapter 10 as well, and 
as he speaks of the Lord's Supper, he calls it a communion. That's the New King James Version. The New American Standard Version and the Holman Version translate that a sharing. The English Standard Version translates that participation. The Greek word means unity. It means a special kind of love and togetherness. A unity together. He says when we take the Lord's Supper together, there is a special unity and connection among us because we are connecting with Christ. Paul will, excuse me, John will talk about the fellowship that we have one with another because of the fellowship we have with the Father in the letter we'll look at in the next series in a few weeks, 1 John. So it's supposed to be a special bonding together as the family of God. But that's not what was going on in Corinth. That's what Paul's pulling out here. They were coming together physically, but relationally and spiritually, they were remaining separate. Physically together, spiritually and relationally separated. All of the New Testament churches took the Lord's Supper regularly. How often? We have absolutely no idea. Why? Because it's never stated. There is no biblical description of the exact time that they took the Lord's Supper or the frequency. We believe they took it often because we find it in several different places. But we have no instruction about when specifically it's to be taken. In fact, Jesus and Paul instructs as often as you do it. That's all he said. As often as you do this. Well, how often is often? Well, that just depends on who you are, I expect. But that is why you will find various churches and different denominations practicing it at different frequencies for various reasons because there it is. We don't have a defin definitive time. There is nothing specifically that tells us that we have to practice it every time we come together. Neither is there any reason that says why we specifically don't. So you can... Take it every time, and some churches do, and you can take it every once in a while, and some churches do. Now, what often happened is that, and that's going on in Corinth, is that when they took that meal, so the Passover's over, right? It was a huge, big meal, and I mean, big thing. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus just took two elements from it, that feast. Well, maybe it's because they were used to that, the Jewish believers practicing having a big feast when Jesus took those two elements and they just did that annually. <laughs> or maybe it's because they were really Baptists and just didn't declare it, but they like to eat. So they, when they took the Lord's Supper, often prior to taking the Lord's Supper, they would have a big feast and they called it an agape feast, an agape, agape festival. They called it a love feast. So they'd get together and have a great big fellowship and then practice the Lord's Supper. That's what's going on here, and that's what Paul is saying. Uh, there's a problem with it. Not with the feast itself, but with some things they were doing in it. At Corinth, the membership was supposed to come together in unity, but they weren't. So now back up to verse 17, prior to where we began reading. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, is it not for the better, but for the worse? For the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the, <clears throat> the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. What's going on? Well, they were supposed to come together in unity, but they weren't. See, they were me meeting together, but they were meeting together in cliques. There was division among them. Specifically, Paul points out, they were dividing based on class. So, as we come together for a big feast, all the rich people sat over there. All the poor people sat over there. Oh, and by the way, rich get to eat first. Poor eat last. And so the rich would take most of the food and leave very little for the poor among them. 
Paul says, I've got a problem with that. There's nothing about unity in that whatsoever. And then you take the Lord's Supper following that, that is what? To remind us that Jesus died for our sins when in the very feast that you are practicing it, you are sinning. By how you treat one another. Some of them were sinning openly and unrepentant. Some of them just had sinful attitudes in their hearts. So Paul says you should not take the Lord's Supper, which is a a memorial of Jesus dying for our sins, you should not take that in an unworthy manner. Therefore, he says, you should examine yourself. So when we take it, it's a time for us to look within our own hearts for unconfessed sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said those who profess to be Christians, those who profess to be born-again believers, but are openly sinning and unrepentant with respect to sins that damage the gospel, are not allowed to participate in the Lord's Supper. In other words, in 1 Corinthians 5, he says as a church family, those who are openly unrepentant in their sin and damaging the witness of the gospel by the sins they're committing, you're to call them out. Follow the practice of church discipline that Jesus instructed us in and tell them they are forbidden to fellowship in the Lord's Supper. Why? Because you are professing a false gospel. You're saying, it's perfectly fine if I sin all I want and still thank Jesus for dying for those sins. So that's not even a testimony of salvation. But not all sin is known, and not all sin is public. Not all sin is a public damage to the Gospels. And so that's why Paul says we need to examine ourselves. Some sin is only in your heart and only you know it. So Paul says, before you take the Lord's Supper, look within. And it was serious. So serious, notice in verse 30, Paul says that some of you, are because you haven't done that, are physically ill. You're sick. He said, some of the sicknesses that you have is not related to the flu or some coronavirus. It is the fact that you have sinned in the Lord's Supper. Ouch. And some of it is, some of you, he said, even died. That's pretty serious. Because God's judged them. For what? I mean, mean, he would let them be sick or some of them die? For what? For their arrogance. For the fact that they were taking the Lord's Supper knowing that they were refusing. Not that they were concerned that they were sinners and bothered by it, but the fact that they knew they were sinning and did not care. They refused to repent and change, nor did they want to. That's why God judged them. And in this particular case, it was their selfishness and their ill treatment of one another that they knew they were practicing. And so it was in essence like slapping Jesus in the face on the cross saying, you know what, you died for nothing, doesn't matter. Now, we are never worthy. He says don't take it. He doesn't say take it if you're worthy. He says don't take it in an unworthy manner. That's different. You and I are never, never worthy in the sense of perfection. I mean, we're never going to do enough. We're never going to be good enough. We're never going to be sinless enough to be worthy of it. That's not what he's talking about. The idea is an attitude of repentance, not perfection. So the idea is not that I have sinned, but it's the fact that I am repentant of the sin I've committed. And I'm acknowledging that. That's why we take a moment before every Lord's Supper to give us a moment to do that. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. So before you take the Lord's Supper and you want to take this honorably for what it's for, you examine your you have the Holy Spirit examine your heart. If he convicts you of sin, what do you do? Repent. God, I'm wrong, you're right. I, please forgive me. I, I, I mean you repent. In other words, you acknowledge you want to change your heart. But what if he does, what if I I I I just don't feel worthy, but I can't, he's not, I don't can't think of anything specific that I haven't already said. Well, I just told you you're never going to be worthy. So you take the Lord's Supper. It's the repented heart, not perfection. What if she brings something to your mind and you just I'm just not ready to repent yet. I'm just not ready to, I just don't want to change yet. I'm 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 not ready to say I'm going to quit or I'm going to change. Then don't take the supper. Paul says we look in. 
So what are some ways that we could take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? Well, one of them is by ignoring it or making it, making light of it, making out as if it's unimportant. By failing to observe it meaningfully. <clears throat> I know we're just being flippant and casual with it. Another way we could be taking it in, a, in an unworthy manner is, b- is by giving it too much meaning. In other words, by assuming that it is going to be sufficient enough to save us. That is why in our particular denominational practice, we don't practice it every week. Because we don't want to give it any more meaning than it should have, nor take away from the meaning that it does. So in other words, we don't want to practice it so often that we just get flippant with it. And just something we do every week. We want to take it seriously. But of course we want to take it often enough that we take it seriously. And there's no tried and true formula for that. How else will we take it in an unworthy manner? By refusing to confess and repent of sin that we are convicted of. By having a lack of respect for God, a lack of love for God and for others. Or by sowing discord among the membership. Now once you look back at verse 26, kind of in the middle of this passage, we jump back to that to, for our third and final practice of the Lord's Supper, why we do, how we do it. So we look back and remember what Jesus did in the past. We look within and confess any sin in the present. But what else do we do every time we take the Lord's Supper? So look again at verse 26. The scripture says, <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. That's past. So as often as you're taking it, that's present. You proclaim the Lord's death. That's past. What's the last phrase looking at? The future. Until he comes. So we look ahead and rejoice. One particular pastor I read about said there was a family at the end of his street who kept their Christmas lights on beyond Christmas. And that's back in, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, that was a big deal. Today, they keep them on all year round. Right? Some of them, you turned them on already. <clears throat> but that was not cool back a couple of few decades ago. And so back then, in this particular time, he said, that was just weird. Nobody kept their Christmas lights on after Christmas. They kept them on into February. And he could never figure out why. It was a family down at the end of the street. And then all of a sudden, one day, near the end of February, there's a big sign out front that said, Welcome home, Johnny. And then he realized what was going on. Johnny was a son of the family serving in Vietnam. And he was just coming home. And they wanted to wait and celebrate Christmas when Johnny came home. And so they were celebrating Christmas with the homecoming of the family. They were all that time looking forward to Johnny coming back home. And they wanted everybody to know it. When believers, the family of God, celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are announcing to the world and to one another that we are looking forward to Jesus coming home. Or really, rather, coming to take us, to take us home. For Jesus coming back. So, Paul says, for as often as you proclaim. The word proclaim is a cool word in the Greek language. You know what it means? It means tell again. For as often as you tell it again. Whenever you tell it again. In other words, every time you take the Lord's Supper, you know what you're doing? You're telling it again. You're telling a message. You are, you are preaching a powerful, in fact, one of the most incredible sermons in history you are preaching, all of us are preaching at the same time when we, when we celebrate that, the story. The Lord's Supper is not only a time of proclamation, it's a time of celebration. Celebrating what? Jesus died, but he didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. He conquered death, ascended to the Father, and said, I'm coming back. Even so, come quickly, Lord. So when we take the Lord's Supper, we're saying one day, we're going to eat with Jesus in the marriage supper of the Lamb in, hev- and Lamb in heaven. We're saying every time we take the Lord's Supper, we believe He died for our sins, but we believe He's coming back. We believe you will be in, with Him in heaven we will all be together with Him for all eternity. 
I mean, we can be distressed and depressed in this sin-sick, infested world, and often we are. But when we take the Lord's Supper, we can remember we're only in this place until He comes. But He's coming. It reminds us that heaven awaits. Maybe He'll come in my lifetime or in your lifetime and we'll all see Him together. Or maybe He'll just come get me in the last breath of life when I die and take me home. Either way, He's going to come get me. And when I think about that, and I think about where I'm going, then joy takes over again. I can be enthralled in this sin sick world I'm in and the situations that I'm in right now, and I look at, I take the word supper and remind, yeah, but it's just till he comes. He reminds me that in the past he died for my sins so that in the future I can go home to heaven. Well, <clears throat> Let's try to answer a couple more questions before we practice that supper. A couple of them I've said already, but let's just, remo- let's just answer these three things. Who should take the Lord's Supper? Answer, baptized believers. Because why? When you take the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming the message of your salvation that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that He died for your sins. You're looking past at that. You're looking presently in your heart as a believer to see if there's any unconfessed sins and looking forward to His coming to get you. That's the testimony of a believer. Now, I mentioned baptized believers, and here's why. Baptism was the first one. It was the first ordinance given to us that proclaims our born-again experience. And so, my personal conviction is that if... You haven't been baptized, you at least ought to have it scheduled when you take the Lord's Supper. Why? Because if you take the Lord's Supper but refuse to be baptized, then in essence you are taking it in an unworthy manner because it's a sin not to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. When should we take the Lord's Supper? Repeatedly. We don't want to take away from its meaning nor add to it. <clears throat> How should we prepare for the Lord's Supper? We've answered that one already too. Self-examination. It means we need, to un- we need to confess unrepented sin. We need to seek to restore relationships with believers where possible. We need to have a spirit of humility, of adoration, of reverence. We take it seriously. And when we take the Lord's Supper, we have a tremendous opportunity every single time to draw closer to Christ. I mean, how, how could we not if we take it for the purpose it's been given? How could we not grow closer to, grow closer to Christ every time we do? Because I'm looking back at what Jesus Christ did for me on a cross. That draws me to the feet of the cross. And I look within to see if there's any sin that is separating my fellowship with Him. If I repent of that, that draws me closer. And if I look forward to His coming to take me home, well, that sure makes me draw closer. Because I want to go. There is an opportunity for us to draw closer to each other. Why? Because Paul says, because we know that... He, we, we, we looked at this last week. Because we thus judge and know that if He died for one, he di- we know He died for all. So I look around and go, yeah, but he, although he died for me, he died for us. So we're together in this. So we draw closer to each other. That's a great opportunity, and it's always an opportunity to look forward to our coming king. I, I don't know when he's coming. Nobody does. And anybody who says they do is lying to you. Period. They're a false prophet. Scripture doesn't say when he's coming. Gives us some signs, but doesn't even tell us fully how to interpret them. Jesus the Son said when asked that question that he didn't know. Only the Father has that answer. <clears throat> but he is coming. They both, Father, Son, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit c- can confess us he's coming. Wouldn't it be cool? Or whatever word you want to use. Wouldn't it be awesome if he came when we were practicing the Lord's Supper? Wouldn't that be awesome? 
I don't know if it'd be in the next few minutes. If it didn't, I'm still looking forward. The next few hours, the next few years. Or after I'm gone. But I'm ready. Are you? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to take that supper in just a few minutes. But before we do, we want to take time and do what the Word of God has instructed us to do. And as we look back and remember that Jesus died for our sins, we in the present moment look within for any unconfessed sin. Is there something that as you ask the Lord to reveal to you, maybe he already has, maybe he will in this moment. If he doesn't, then that's okay. I mean, don't deny him, but if he doesn't, then just, just ask simply to get your heart ready to take this in a meaningful way. But if there's something that he is convicting you that you have done that you need to ask his forgiveness for, or something that you haven't done, he's been telling you to do that you've not, then ask his forgiveness. It's forgiveness with the intent to change, not just, Lord, please forgive me so I can take the supper. No, it is, I want to change. Please forgive me that I might change. Take a moment and confess that. (laughs) If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you're in this room or listening online, then let me encourage you, take this moment to get ready. He could come any minute or any year, or any decade, but he is going to come. And when you take your life, if he doesn't come in the eastern sky before you, your lifetime is up, one day your lifetime will be up. It's just that simple. And then we will stand before the judge. Are you ready? Do you know him as your Savior and Lord? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus died on that cross that you and I might be forgiven. The wages of sin is death. Every one of us are accountable to our Creator. And God takes sin seriously. And there is but one way to be fully forgiven and given eternal life in heaven, and that is through a relationship with Jesus. That is accepting that the sinless Son of God died on a cross for your sins. He paid the price for you as He did for me. And if you would acknowledge that, if you would express to him that you believe that and that he rose again on the third day to give you life. Having been sinless, death could not hold him and he rose from the grave as the Son of God. If you would surrender your life to the living Lord Jesus, you can have eternal life and a home guaranteed in heaven. It is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Nothing else compares. Nothing. If you need to do that this morning, I'm going to say a prayer that may express what you may want to say to him. And so if God is speaking to you now in this moment and you know that's the decision you want to make, then uh, these aren't magic words, but they might help express what's in your heart so you could follow along with me or in the quietness of your mind and heart, repeat what I say. I'm going to say that prayer, and then we're going to take a few more minutes to, to sing and, and to pray and, and do whatever else we need to be doing this morning before our supper in response to the Lord. But if that's you, then, then let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Almighty God, I come to you to ask forgiveness, for I acknowledge that I have sinned, that I am a sinner, that I need forgiveness, and I need a relationship with you. I acknowledge that in my pride, I have done what I want to do, and I want to submit to you. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And I believe that he's coming again. I don't understand it all, don't know how it all works, but in the depth of my soul, I know it's right. And so I ask, Father, for your forgiveness, and I ask Jesus to come into my life. I surrender to you as my Savior and my Lord, that I might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.